The Innocents is a 1961 movie directed by Jack Clayton. It's an adaptation of a play by the same name, based on Henry James's famous ghost story, The Turn of the Screw. The movie script was written by William Archibald and Truman Capote, and the story follows a sheltered governess by the name of Miss Giddens, who is hired to look after two children, Flora and Miles, at the estate of Bly, which is presided over by a caretaker named Mrs. Gross. Now, this video isn't going to focus on the plot of The Innocents, or the who's who of actors and directors. Rather, I'm going to focus on the music, camera, framing, set design, symbolism, and ultimately the ambiguity which makes this movie so special. When you watch The Innocents, the very first thing you'll see is a black screen. The opening 20th Century Fox fanfare is gone, and you'll hear a young girl sing a soft song about a weeping willow. Originally, this song did not exist in the play version, and was instead a recitation of Tennyson's Mariana. A willow whaley was created specifically for the movie. It is used as a leitmotif that you can hear very early on in the background of Miss Giddens' arrival at Bly. As she walks through the gardens before ever entering the house or meeting the children, she hears someone call Flora's name, as well as the bass of O Willow Whaley. And this leitmotif is repeated multiple times throughout the film, very subtly. Indeed, the entirety of the movie has a rather limited musical scope, preferring to instead focus on characters and imagery. The music isn't afraid to step back, and more often than not, the sound design relies upon the atmospheric, building up, only to cut away to complete silence. And while there are moments where the music will swell, it's only ever to carry the moment, and you will walk away from this movie remembering only one tune, this one. I won't bore you with too much detail, but the camera is important to talk about in any film, because the camera is the vehicle through which the story is told. Its shortcomings and its strengths will have an impact on how the audience perceives the movie and everything within it. Now, today, the two most common aspect ratios for movies are 185 and 239. To give examples, The Avengers in 2012 was filmed in 185, and Endgame was filmed in 239. But The Innocents was filmed in 240. That's right, this movie is bigger than Endgame. It's thick, with 14 Cs. But why? 239 is supposed to be big enough for a cast like Endgame, with more characters than I even care to name, let alone a ghost story with only four principal characters. Creepy Kid number one, Creepy Kid number two, a token straight, and the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. So why was such a wide aspect ratio chosen? And what impact does this have on the film's storytelling? To answer the first question, it's because the lens used in this film was the Cinemascope, patented by 20th Century Fox. At the time, 20th Century Fox was trying to compete with the rise of home television in the 50s and 60s, so they required their directors to use this lens as a marketing ploy. The thought was that by creating an ultra-wide cinematic experience, you would get more people coming to the theatre. Think IMAX, but in the 50s and 60s. The cinemascope is an anamorphic lens, and again I won't go into great detail, but in essence there's a system of stretching going on, which overall has greater detail and breadth, but can result in image distortion. Freddie Francis, the cinematographer for The Innocents, said that Jack Clayton was shattered to learn from 20th Century Fox that he would have to film in cinemascope because he wanted an intimate approach with the characters which he thought that film technique didn't allow. So after the music, the second thing you'll notice is that the shots are very broad, but Clayton and Francis weren't deterred and even managed to use this to their advantage. They often tampered with a lens to create effects that you may not even realize while watching for the first time. The broad shots can make Bly and its gardens feel very lush and sprawling, yet all throughout the film there's a sort of fisheye effect. Think Yorgos Lanthimos's The Favourite for a more extreme example. This is especially apparent when the camera pushes into extreme close-ups, which it often does, to create staged foreground background contrasts between characters on screen. The anamorphic distortion makes the characters' faces feel stretched. It's not at all dissimilar to how modern anime extreme close-ups do that thing we all laugh about, you know the one. 
Even without the close-ups, though, you can still see this distortion or cylindrical perspective in broad scenes like Miss Giddens walking through the gardens, where the edges of the plants and the path seem to bend around her. The distorted faces create a sense of being pressed right up against the character in the foreground, as though you're there with them, huddling in the same space, almost in their shoes. Instead of feeling intimacy, we feel claustrophobia. And this claustrophobia is only intensified when the director used special filters, about a dozen of them, which would darken or blur the edges of the screen so that it creates a tunnel effect. The broad 240 aspect ratio turns instead from a sprawling epic landscape to a crowded experience where your view is focused down, only to broaden back up again. And this is actually a staple of horror. As Dr. Rebecca McKendry, professor at USC School of Cinematic Arts, points out, Limiting the audience's view, focusing it down, always creates a sense of anxiety and tension necessary specifically for jump scares. And arguably the most claustrophobic scene in The Innocence is the jump scare scene, where Miss Giddens is wandering the halls and mistakes a statue for a ghost. In the hands of Clayton and Francis, the camera is very effectively used to create tension, to create claustrophobic scenarios, to push the horror of the movie into a classic. In order to further push that forced perspective, they used lights to create valleys between the background and the foreground. Sometimes nearly every light in the studio would be poured into a narrow space to get this effect. Deborah Carr could be seen wearing sunglasses around the set. She even commented on the heat of the lights and the close-ups brought the camera so nearly on top of her that she felt herself going cross-eyed as she and it confronted a distance of inches. The first time Miss Giddens sees a ghost is in a glare of light, and again she sees a ghost on a hot sunny day across the lake. Light is as deceptive as darkness. It obscures, it casts reflections and shadows in doubt. Also, can we take a moment to talk about how beautiful the lighting is? The attention to detail in this movie with light is so amazing, especially with the way dimmers are used so that the candles always seem to cast the right light from the right perspective. It's, it's so good. It's just so good. Speaking of candles, there's one scene in particular which shows how light distorts time and creates ambiguity. And that's the scene where Miss Giddens is wandering the house at night, carrying a candelabra. The candles were specifically made with four wicks that burned two inches high, smoking to high heaven, but looking fantastic on screen. The director wanted them to have these large dramatic flames, but the result was that they burned too hot and too fast. Because of this, perhaps serendipitously, it gives the illusion that she's been wandering the house, lost for quite some time. The camera follows her for so long, the audience and Miss Giddens seem to lose track of time as well as where they are in the house. This framing and lighting, this tunnel effect of the filters adds to the confusion and the inevitable jump scare with the statues. All of this creates a world that is both broad yet claustrophobic, intimate yet distant. Things move at the very fringes of the camera, be they backgrounds or people or reflections. Everything is designed to force your eye to strain to see what is happening all around, so that you have to risk losing track of one figure in order to focus on another, or to narrow your focus inwards so that you can't see what's happening at the edges. Shots are repeated and paralleled, but made slightly different each time. It's a fractal arrangement that comes together piece by piece. The camera, the framing, and the set design all work in tandem to play tricks on you, to make you second guess. They fill the house with paintings and tapestries of people and monsters that clutter the walls in the background. They fill the gardens and promenades with statues. There are windows and mirrors at every turn, casting reflections. Is that a ghost you just saw? Or was it just Miss Giddens' reflection in the window? Was that a man or was it a statue? There are scenes where Miss Giddens sees what she thinks is a man or a ghost, but it turns out to be nothing. And the audience undergoes the same experience by way of the camera. Those spot the ghost games from more modern adaptations, such as The Haunting of Bly Manor, is actually quite an old trick, and we can very clearly see the influence from the innocence. But this begs the question, whose perspective is the camera taking? In the original book, the governess is the narrator. At times, the camera seems to assume the perspective of Miss Giddens. We accompany her on carriage rides and wander through the house. We see reflections and figures that could be spectral but which vanish the next instant, or which upon closer inspection could be explained away with pragmatism. We see Miss Giddens' reactions to the ghosts before we ever see the ghosts themselves. We are hiding with her behind the curtains during a game of hide-and-seek. We look down and see her shoes at our feet. By that same logic, however, the camera also at times assumes a voyeur perspective. We lurk 
around pillars and trees, following Miss Giddens through the gardens. We stare at Miss Giddens from the top of staircases and down long, narrow corridors. We watch from the manor windows as she chases Miles through the statue garden. We are the ghosts haunting Bly and haunting her. Yet at the beginning of the movie, Miss Giddens is imploring, her hands lifted before the camera in supplication, as she informs us before we even know anything about her or the story that she only meant to save the children, words she repeats to Mrs. Gross in a later scene. And it is times like this that the perspective shifts so that the audience becomes the jury. In terms of symbolism, Miss Giddens is often associated with white roses throughout the course of the movie. She's either striding through fields of them, or framed with them, or surrounded by them, or they're even superimposed over her. At times, she brushes against them, causing them to lose their petals. Other times, she's cutting them, or arranging new vases of them in the house. At one point, a petal falls upon a Bible she reads. What they symbolize can mean any number of things. They can be the decaying manor itself, which she tries to fill with life by bringing in fresh bouquets. They can be her decaying innocence or the decaying innocence of the children. They can be our decaying perception of her as the story goes on. But the white roses fade more and more throughout the film. Her clothes even reflect this symbolism until the garden in the final scene is grim and Miss Giddens chases Miles through it in a black velvet dress. Innocence becomes corruption, and these phrases are often spoken by the characters almost in an ironic self-awareness of what's happening. White roses aren't the only symbol of innocence in the film, though. Another more often associated with Miles are the doves frequenting the grounds. He can be seen caring for them in one scene, and in another hiding a dead dove beneath his pillow for Miss Giddens to discover in a moment of horror at night, its neck snapped. By who? We don't know, though presumably by Miles himself, or perhaps by the ghost of Peter Quint possessing Miles, if Miss Giddens' supernatural claims are to be believed. There's also the disfigured Cupid statue Miss Giddens stumbles across while in the Rose Garden. She watches as a bug crawls from its mouth, and the statue itself appears to be puppeted by hands cut off at the wrist. A shot which is paralleled during one of Miss Giddens' later dream sequences, where she sees Peter's and Miles' disembodied hands reach out towards one another. But perhaps my favourite symbolism shot in the entire film, and there are many, is of Miss Giddens entering the manor for the first time. Right here. But even this isn't straightforward. The halo is a web, and in another scene, Flora admires a spider eating a butterfly trapped in its web. Which begs the question, is Miss Giddens the spider or the butterfly? So what is the truth? Are the ghosts real? Clytie Jessup, the actress who played Miss Jessel, said in an interview with the BBC that Truman Capote cut large amounts of her and Peter Wingard's characters because, as he said, those ghosts are much too real. Get rid of them. The ghosts are almost always obscured by light or glass or distance. Miles at one point says, I made them up, when Miss Giddens presses him about Peter. The truth becomes very quickly muddled. Is this just imagination or hallucination? Imagination is mentioned multiple times throughout the movie. Even in the very opening scene, the uncle says, Do you have an imagination? Oh, oh, yes, I can answer that. Yes. Good. Truth is very seldom understood by any but imaginative persons, and I want to be quite truthful. Whose perspective is the one we're seeing? Everything we see Miss Giddens reacting to is somehow dragged into doubt and ambiguity. Did she see that? Did she even hear that? There are roars of sound that cut to glaring silence. And one source reckons that the ambiguity of the text itself is suggested to be because Miss Giddens is not only the point of view, but the editor, cutting things, adding them, smoothing others out. Miss Giddens seems to make leaps in connecting the dots, which sometimes only make her look like she's inventing these things even more. But the ambiguity goes far beyond that. Before filming began, they cut an opening scene of Miles's funeral, where everyone is watching Miss Giddens askance. Instead, they replace this with Miss Giddens' opening words that she only wanted to save the children. So we don't even really know what happened to Miles. If he died? If Quint no longer possessed him? If Quint went on to possess her instead? The director was begged for weeks by the president of Fox to change the ending where Miss Giddens kisses Miles, and Jack Clayton flat refused. Upon rewatch, everyone is cast into doubt, especially Miss Giddens. The more we see her throughout the film, the more her credibility seems to degrade, until we're left wondering what her intentions with the children ever were. 
Her naivete is brought into question, and her reasons for wanting to become a governess, until the most innocuous lines are viewed with suspicion. I mean, listen to this exchange in the opening scene with the uncle. More than anything, I love children. Yes. Why did you have to say it like that? What the hell is that supposed to mean? Why can't you just say it like a normal <laughs> Ultimately, Jack Clayton didn't want this movie to be another Hammer film. He agonized over it not being too gory. He wanted it to be subtle. He wanted the ghosts to be something you saw only at the corner of the retina. It's an exercise in suggestion. Deborah Carr said about the movie, With Jack Clayton's help, plus my own feelings, I tried to tread a very narrow tightrope between Miss Giddens being an internally and sexually tormented woman and a completely normal human being who found herself beset by evil powers. I think Jack and I both wanted to leave it to the audience, which resulted in the film's strangely disturbing quality. Whichever way you choose to read this film, it will hold up. And that's one of the most brilliant things about it. The script is so tightly written. No line is wasted. Everything mirrors back somehow, even the beginning and end sequence creating neat bookends around the piece as a whole. Whether you choose to interpret the story as a woman going mad, or as a true ghost story where ghosts are real, the film will support any argument you make, both textually and subtextually. The deliberation of ambiguity in the innocence is supported by the script, by the camera, by the set design and music, even in some cases by the aspect ratio. And that is ultimately what makes it so special and such a hallmark of classic horror. And that's why I think that you should give it a try. I know that Halloween is over, but uh, maybe next time when you want to watch a scary movie and turn off the lights, put this one on.